In today's episode, we meet with Professor William Oliver at MIT to explore how he's bringing the theoretical potential of quantum computing into practical reality. We'll also take you behind the scenes for an exclusive look inside the MIT.nano clean room where superconducting quantum chips, the so-called brain of a quantum computer, are designed and fabricated. Next, we'll get up close with the cryostat or chandelier, often referred to as the body of a quantum computer. Join us as we dive into the fascinating world of quantum technology with MIT students and researchers. You are one of the most prolifically cited uh, author in the world of quantum, so... I wouldn't go that far, <laughs> but thank you. So it's good to be here with you, too. Uh, you were actually working on quantum even before the term qubit uh, was known to uh, the rest of us. So uh, tell us about that journey, you know, uh, what did those two uh, decades entail? Yeah, I always always been fascinated by quantum phenomena. And um, as a PhD, I went to Stanford in 1997 working with Yoshi Yamamoto and um, working on quantum effects, quantum statistics, um, almost no practical application for what I was doing, but, but really was able to study you know, these types of quantum phenomena. And at that time, quantum computing was just starting to stand up. So in, in 2003, I wanted to work on quantum computing. And uh, so I came here to MIT, and Professor Terry Orlando was a co-inventor of the flux qubit, one of the mm -hmm. superconducting qubits early on. And I knew that I wanted to work on quantum computing, but I also wanted to, I realized that if this were going to become a scalable, uh, useful technology, that we actually had to build, uh, you know, not just one qubit, but many qubits. And mm -hmm. so I went to Lincoln Laboratory, where they have a fantastic fabrication facility, microelectronics lab. And in the early days, superconducting qubits really weren't that good, so it was kind of a risky choice, but you know, 20 years on, it turned out to be a good choice, and superconducting qubits are indeed uh, now uh, one of the leading platforms to build a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. So, Will, um, quantum is obviously generating a lot of uh, excitement these days. Uh, Google recently announced the Willow chip, um, and you know, uh, quantum is just making a lot of headlines. Uh, but on the flip side, this also means that uh, there's a lot of hype potentially around quantum. So, when do you think uh, a useful computer will actually be introduced to the world uh, so that uh, st people start using them? Yeah, well, first off, yeah, the Google result is fantastic. The Willow chip. Indeed, is the first one to demonstrate uh, quantum error correction uh, beyond threshold, and we can talk more about what that means. Uh, but, but it's really a fantastic demonstration. And and you're absolutely right that, you know, there's an announcement every day, uh, that breakthrough or something like this, and um, there's a lot of hype, and it's quite frothy, and you know, there's hype that reflects the fact that quantum computing is very exciting, right? Of course, um, but. But at the same time, if there's too much hype, and we can get into a hype cycle where there's uh, disappointment, you know, the reality doesn't live up to the hype or it doesn't happen quickly enough. So I, want to, I think we want to avoid these hype cycles where it's up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, the people who are doing quantum computing should regulate um, carefully what they're presenting into the press. But, but having said all that, the, the Willow demonstration is indeed a, a very important milestone because it is the first time that we've demonstrated quantum error correction beyond threshold. Yeah. Um, you asked me when we will have a useful quantum computer. Mm -hmm. um, I often respond by asking, uh, well, when did we have a useful conventional computer? Like what year was it or what day was it? And it's a very difficult question to answer because um, technology doesn't just one day become suddenly useful. Mm -hmm. It's not a step function, but it's a gradual set of steps. Technology evolves. And so I think that quantum computing today, in fact, is generating revenue. I don't know that anyone's making a profit per se, um, but there are many companies that have jumped into quantum computing. Uh, mm -hmm. IBM is a good example where they've put quantum computers into the cloud. And um, some of them they're offering uh, for free to people in the community to use, but mm -hmm. to many companies on their largest machines, they're charging uh, for that time. And, and companies can learn um, how quantum computing is gonna affect their bottom line in the future on small scale problems. Mm -hmm. So these computers that we have today, quantum computers, are not, uh, I would say, at a size that is commercially relevant, but at the same time, we can start practicing or playing or developing algorithms on these small quantum computers. And so, um, and IBM is able to generate 
revenue from that. So I would say those are useful computers for, for IBM. Um, at the same time, if we're thinking, when are we going to be developing new pharmaceutical drugs or something like mm -hmm, this? Okay, mm -hmm. that's very far on the evolution. And that could be uh, 10, 15, 20 years away. Um, but tying it back to the Google demonstration, it absolutely will require quantum error correction, and we've mm -hmm. seen that milestone just this week. Well, you mentioned drug discovery, yeah, but you know, there's, a, I think, a lot of excitement uh, towards quantum because they think it's going to revolutionize drug discovery, material science, and other fields like cryptography, right? Um, personally, what are you the most interested in uh, in terms of application? Yeah, I, I think the the simulation of quantum systems is what you know I think drives me and is, is commercially the most relevant mm -hmm. in the sense that um, quantum computers can emulate or simulate materials, uh, chemical reactions, um, and engineers can then use these results to develop, okay, new batteries or new drugs based on these simulation results. I also like this because it's relevant to fundamental science and mm -hmm. discovery and that in physics, we'll often use models to describe um, a system, but how well does that model actually represent that system? Yeah. Um, can I uh, benchmark the model and can I emulate the system? And we see how close those two come together. Or perhaps with a quantum computer, I can emulate a material or a system in a regime that just isn't practical to realize here on Earth. Maybe, maybe it's something that can be realized uh, at very high energies or at very large magnetic fields or something that's very difficult to do. But if I have a quantum system that I'm modeling with my qubits and I can tune the parameters of my qubits, I may be able to tune them into that regime. So they're mm -hmm. actually mimicking or emulating the system as if it were in that extreme environment. And mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting. Your lab uh, is a very multidisciplinary and it takes yes. care of uh, fundamental science but technical applications as well, right? So how do you kind of balance the two? Yeah, well, of course, uh, as a professor, I, I, we are educating students and postdocs, future leaders in this field. And so whatever we do, it should be um, pushing the boundary. Uh, mm -hmm. And that typically means we're looking at fundamental science or I would even say fundamental or foundational engineering. So, so that's what we're trying to do here. But, but then the ethos of the group is that whatever we do that's mm. either foundational or fundamental, uh, we do it with an ethos uh, that it's uh, reproducible, mm. extensible, or scalable mm -hmm. so that it becomes applicable to um, future commercialization or realization of this technology at a larger scale. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the guiding principle. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, how we determine the balance is just we, we follow our interests. Mm -hmm. And we know what the interesting problems are. Uh, and then uh, we just aim towards those mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and try to solve real problems. Mm, that's amazing. So I love your ethos. Don't just do science for the sake of science. I mean, that's you know, very appreciated. Right. But at the same time, you know, do it for something that can potentially have a big impact uh, and is applicable to the real world. So I think I think yeah. that's right. And you know, we often talk about um, fundamental science, and that's mm -hmm. absolutely important for quantum. But science has been working in the quantum area for you know 100 plus years. But quantum computing, in gen in pr particular, mm -hmm. for the last say three decades or so. But the engineering side is just starting to stand up. We call that quantum engineering. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's deeply rooted in science. Um, half of MIT is School of Science. Half is School of Engineering. And engineering isn't just building big things. It's learning how do I scale? What mm -hmm. do I need to do? What are the rules of thumb that I need to develop? And, and I would coin this equally as a foundational or fundamental engineering discipline. Mm -hmm. um, often when people use the word engineering, they think, oh, you're just building a rocket ship or something. But, but the point is, is that there is a fundamental engineering behind how that works. Mm -hmm. And one of the goals of the group is to develop or learn how to scale. So even though we won't build necessarily a large scale quantum computer here at MIT, mm -hmm. we, can, we can build the foundation so that a Google or an IBM or an Amazon mm -hmm. can then go and, mm. and build a large scale. And I'm always fascinated by people that are actually in quantum because it's a very long-term kind of you know, a journey and uh, you're not 
seeing a, a very immediate outcome, right? Yes. So, um, you know, how do you kind of pursue that dream? You've been doing this for a very long time now, but how do you keep yourself and your students motivated? Well, I think, you know, clearly it's a passion for us. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what we like to do. Um, it's not hard to get people excited about quantum. Mm. You know, quantum's strange, you know, we don't experience it every day. And the outcomes that we see often are counterintuitive. And, and for many of us, we find that to be extremely interesting. Uh, and, and so we're, we're already starting with a fertile field. And sure, it's been going on for a long time, uh, but I think that's a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it means that as we answer questions, we introduce new questions and we're introducing more and more uh, unknowns as we go forward and we solve them and then we continue to move forward. And I think this is what motivates us is that there's, there is both an unknown and yet we know that when we can build uh, a large scale quantum computer, it mm -hmm. will be able to do things that we simply either can't do today or just mm -hmm. are practically prohibitive. You could do them in principle, but it would take way too long way too much energy mm -hmm. um, and and there is an aspect to this that that we know that quantum computers will be able to or hold the potential to I should say solve some problems that humankind is facing right now mm -hmm. you know we mm -hmm. do have to address climate change mm -hmm. and um, maybe quantum computing has a role to help us do that. I think uh, physics PhDs usually think that uh, it's it's sometimes not the most lucrative and they get into the field because it's really interesting um, but you must be seeing maybe, you know, uh, an uptick in, uh, in just uh, the sheer interest in quantum. Have you kind of witnessed change in terms of just general interest towards quantum in the university space as well in the last five years or so? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, there's always been this, this echelon of folks who are interested in quantum for quantum's sake. And they've been, you know, we've had those people in our physics departments uh, for, for decades. But, but I would say that with the advent of quantum computing, and in particular, IBM putting quantum computers online, and Google having these you know, milestones and demonstrations and other companies, more and more, we're seeing quantum come into the mainstream. Uh, mm -hmm. You may remember from one of our recent presidential debates uh, that the presidential candidates are using the word quantum. Mm -hmm. you know, we didn't hear that 10 years ago, mm -hmm. but now, uh, even President Biden says the word quantum. Quantum mm -hmm. computing is important. Mm -hmm. so, so this is coming into our vernacular language and it's cool. <laughs> and students think it's really cool. Mm -hmm. And it's cool because we don't necessarily understand it. Mm -hmm. And people want to be a part, particularly young people want to be a part of changing the world. And part of changing the world is understanding the things that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so yes, we've absolutely seen an increase in the number of people uh, applying uh, to quantum or to quantum disciplines. And it's not just in the physics department. Mm -hmm. We see it from departments all across MIT. Yeah. And, and, and this reflects the fact that it's starting to mature to a point where we need people from dis different disciplines, mm -hmm. not just physicists. Of course we need physicists. Mm -hmm. And of course we need electrical engineers. But in the future we need people who are chemists who understand the chemistry problems or biologists who understand biology problems. People from the Sloan School of Business who know how to construct startup companies or how to fund them mm -hmm. or how to navigate uh, uncertainty in a business environment. Right? All mm -hmm. of this is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, Kendall Square is supposed to be the most innovative mile on the planet Earth. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> and, surprise me. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that really translates uh, well uh, in the biotech space. Of course, you got the inventions happening you know, from universities and research centers as well as um, VCs and the uh, acquirers. Um, have you seen um, Kendall Square serve as like a very, uh, I guess, um, a supportive uh, kind of engine catalyst uh, in terms of the quantum space as well? Uh, certainly. I, I think that if you look at the academic endeavors here in the Kendall Square, the Boston area more generally, Cambridge area, uh, many of the algorithms that we know of in quantum were developed by uh, faculty here at MIT or the, you know, the broader Boston environment. Um, many of the hardware platforms that are being studied, uh, not just quantum computing, but also quantum sensing, quantum mm -hmm. communication. Uh, and so academically, there's a very strong base and has been for decades here at, uh, in the Boston area. Uh, MIT also, as an institute, includes Lincoln Laboratory, which is our national lab, mm -hmm. uh, FFRDC. Mm -hmm. 
and they're very strong at quantum communication, sensing, and uh, computing as well. So we have that support. Um, and then finally, you know, there's always been a very strong uh, startup uh, mm -hmm. ethos here at MIT mm -hmm. and more broadly in Boston. Uh, MIT's Engine, uh, mm -hmm. you know, MIT Sandbox. These are uh, great, you know, uh, VCs and funders and incubators of new ideas. Lots of ideas come out of MIT. They spin out, start companies. Some fail, some succeed. But but all of that's happening right here, and it's quite fertile. And uh, another point to make is that many of my you know colleagues and friends in Europe that have startup companies, they want to have a foothold in the U.S. Where do they choose? Mm. Well, they choose Boston because there's so much here, and also because distance-wise, about the same mm. from Europe to Boston as Boston to San Francisco. And mm. so that's a great. You know, mm. um, distance-wise, it's good for them. Mm. So, so for many reasons, I'd say across the spectrum, Kendall mm. Square is a great area to start mm. a company. A fascinating discussion. My last question is, you know, um, I think a lot of parents are a little fearful of the future that's coming uh, towards their children's way because the advent and the pace of technology is uh, just, you know, unprecedented, right? Uh, how do you feel about that being at the frontier of all these technology? Yeah, well, you know, of course, we we're passionate about developing new technology, and so we, we push it forward. Uh, it's also a responsibility that we have to make sure that that technology is being used appropriately. Mm -hmm. We don't have a crystal ball, right? Um, we do have historical record. We can see in the past how technology developments have been used both for good and bad. And I think it behooves us to learn from those experiences as we go forward. Um, and, but, but I'm not fearful of technology. Mm. I would be more fearful if we don't develop that technology uh, because, you know, we do have serious problems that we need to address mm. and technology is a way that we can, you know, solve many of those problems. I think on balance, although technology may have caused some problems, uh, I would say it solved many more problems than it has caused and, and I believe it will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, those are very uplifting words indeed. So, uh, Will, thank you so much for uh, this fascinating and very insightful conversation today. Thank you.